Good morning. I consider myself clever this month for the sermons and the way that they are laid out, so they will probably or they will possibly fail dramatically. This morning we will discuss how Jesus is more than David's king. Next week we'll discuss how Jesus is more than Isaiah's prophecy. And the Sunday after that we'll discuss how Jesus is more than a prophet himself. So I'm set up for offering terrific scriptures and ties together to show you how magnificent our Savior is. And hopefully that's what we'll come across. First, I have to establish, though, if Jesus is more than David's king, that David was a king and what he was known for as king. So, 2 Samuel chapter 8. After this, David defeated the Philistines and subdued them. And David took Metheg Amah out of the hand of the Philistines. He defeated Moab and measured them with a line, making them lie down on the ground. Two lines he measured to be put to death and one full line to be spared. Then the Moabites became servants to David and brought tribute. David also defeated Hadadezer, the son of Rehob, king of Zobah, as he went to restore his power at the river Euphrates. David took from him 1,700 horsemen, 20,000 foot soldiers. And David hamstrung all of the chariot horses, but left enough for 100 chariots. He went, and when the Syrians of Damascus came to help Hadadezer, king of Zobah, David struck down 22,000 men of the, of the Syrians. And then David put garrisons in Aram of Damascus, and the Syrians became servants to David and brought tribute. And the Lord gave victory to David wherever he went. And David took the shields of gold that were carried by the servants of Hadadezer from, uh, and brought them to Jerusalem and brought Beta from Berathai, cities of Hadadezer. King David took very much bronze. When Toy, king of Hamath, heard that David had defeated the whole army of Hadadezer, Toy sent his son Jeram to King David to ask about his health and to bless him because he had fought against Hadadezer and defeated him. For Hadadezer had often been at war with Toy. And Jeram brought with him articles of silver, of gold, and of bronze. These also King David dedicated to the Lord together with the silver and gold that he dedicated from all the nations he subdued. From Edom, from Moab, the Ammonites, the Philistines, the Amalek, and from the spoil of Hadadezer, the son of Rehob, king of Zobah. And David made a name for himself when he returned from striking down 18,000 Edomites in the Valley of Salt. Then he put garrisons in Edom. Throughout all Edom he put garrisons, and all Edomites became David's servants. And the Lord gave, David, gave victory to David wherever he went. So David reigned over all Israel. And David administered justice and equity to all his people. Joab, the son of Zeruiah, was over the army. And Jehoshaphat, son of Ahilud, was recorder. And Zadok, son of Ahitub, and Ahimelech, son of Abathar, were priests. And Sarai was secretary. And Benai, son of Jehoiada was over the Cherethites and the Pelethites and David's sons were priests. So David was given conquest. It says in verse 14 that the Lord gave victory to David wherever he went. So conquest was a thing. Saul didn't really get a whole lot done. He was a military leader, but David is the one who pushed the boundaries of Israel back out closer to what had been promised to be fulfilled. So David was uh, quite the conqueror. In First Corinthians, in First Chronicles, chapter twenty-two, there's one of the discussions of uh, building the temple. 
Verse 8, but the word of the Lord came to me, that is to David, saying, You have shed much blood and have waged great wars. You shall not build a house in my name, because you have shed so much blood before me on the earth. David wanted to build this temple. He wanted to build a pretty impressive temple that Solomon does wind up building. But here David is asking if he can do that, and he wants to do that. And God says, You're a man of blood. You can't do that, because... There's too much blood. You and he waged war for God, but still he was a man who who was known for the bloodshed that he did. Did you catch the part about how he lined up the people of Moab in three different lines and he killed two of those lines? David was known for conquest. He was a man of the sword. He was a, he was a man of blood. But Solomon was going to have peace. He wasn't going to be a man of war highlighted that word peace there in verse 9 catch it as it comes back around later David's not able to establish the, the temple he's not able to build the temple he's a pretty great guy in that he gathers all of the things so that Solomon can get right to work on it but that's not what God says he's going to do for David to David he's going to establish his name forever he's going to make his throne a thing in First Chronicles chapter 17, 11, and 12, When your days are fulfilled, you will walk with your fathers. I will raise up your offspring after you, one of your own sons. I will establish his kingdom. He will build a house for me, and I will establish his throne forever. His, his throne is going to go on. Jesus is going to fulfill that. But the Jews take this, the people of Israel take this, and as they're going over trying to be smart, intelligent people and not just smart dummies. They're trying to look for what this is going to look like. Eventually, you know, we see that after Solomon, the kingdom divides, and then uh, piece by piece it's carted off to different countries, and eventually all of the peoples are taken into captivity, and then the, eventually they get to come back. The people are looking for the restoration of the kingdom like David had it, where it's pushed out to the river Euphrates, where it's pushed down into Egypt, uh, where it's pushed up into, uh, up there to the north. And they're look, the, peop, the Jews are looking for a physical ruler. Uh, this is something that Herod is afraid of when after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in that day in the days of Herod the king behold a wise men behold wise men from the east came to Jerusalem saying where is he who has been born king of the Jews for we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him when Herod the king heard this he was troubled and all of Jerusalem with him Herod's going to issue order to kill all of the babies. He doesn't want a challenger to his throne. He's looking for a physical kingdom. One of the things that we accept as we study the Gospels, as we study the book of Acts, is that, oh, well, the, the, the Jews were looking for a physical king and a physical leader. If you'll search through your scriptures, you'll find it's actually pretty difficult to prove that point if you're looking for the sound bite that says, and they were looking for a physical leader. Google that. But this is one of those evidences that shows they were looking for someone to reestablish the throne. Even those who were diligent in searching for him are coming to find, to look for a king. The apostles, as we noted just a couple of weeks ago, as Jesus is lifted from the earth, right before that happens, the question that is recorded for us that they ask to him is, at this time will you restore the kingdom to Israel? Are you going to reestablish a, the throne, the physical throne on the earth? And in fact, as was brought up this morning, the Jews are still those who would hold to only the Old Testament, those who hold to the original covenant that God made with the children of Israel, are still looking for a physical kingdom. 2014, uh, a gentleman by the name of uh, Jacob Staub uh, answered in an article the Jewish messianic belief plays a central role in the lives of Jewish people but it is very different than the Christians belief in Jesus as Christ the redemption that Christ brought is internal transformation 
being saved from one's sinfulness, achieving the inner peace that comes from receiving God's love as a Jew, I rest in God's unconditional love and the ever-flowing blessings that come to me through divine grace. I do not, however, believe that the world I do how I do not, however, believe that the world has yet to be redeemed. In a redeemed world, swords would be turned to plowshares, nobody will go hungry, the powerless will not be oppressed, and justice will prevail everywhere. This was the vision of the biblical prophets, and it remains the foundation of Jewish hope for the future. I can give you the uh, exact website if you need it to find this article. They're looking for a physical kingdom. They're looking for physical restoration. They're looking for the earth to be fixed from its broken and sinful state. And they're, they're still looking for it. And they completely miss what Jesus came to do. The kingdom that he came to establish. The peace and the food that he came to offer. However, this does not change the fact that Jesus is the king. Just because you believe something doesn't mean that it's true. And in Acts chapter 2 verses 29 to 36, one of many places where it discusses Jesus and his current place. In that sermon, Peter closes the sermon out saying, Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried. His tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we, are all, we all are witnesses. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. For David did not ascend to the heavens, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Both are kings, but Jesus is more. Jesus is of the line of David. David perishes, as does Jesus. However, Jesus is raised and is made not only king, but also Christ. God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. So, he's, Jesus is more than David's king. And if you couldn't guess from the last two songs that we selected this morning, he is also our redeemer. This is not news to us, but by the end of the month, it's going to be bigger and bigger in addition. Jesus has authority. In Colossians chapter 1, and, and actually the entire book of Colossians, but in the 16th verse of the first chapter, For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn of the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. Jesus is not just a king. He is king of kings. He is beyond all authority and powers here on earth. So, in a sense, that physical control that the Jews would love to have found and, and shown is there because Christ is over all and they are in him but too much they're focused too much on the physical they're, they're, they had focused too much on the physical actions of this life and often we can get caught up in that and not controlling ourselves physically and looking spiritually but maybe we expect God to do too many things for us physically on this earth as opposed to keeping our focus on Christ or on spiritual matters 
Jesus is the rightful heir. Jesus is the rightful king that comes to the throne or through the blood of David. Uh, in Matthew chapter 1, there's a great big long list of genealogy. It's there for a purpose uh, so that I'd have material for this discussion this morning. And the first verse, it says, the, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. The 17th verse, after all of those folks are listed... So all the generations of from Abraham to David were 14, 14 generations. From David, uh, from, David, <laughs> from David to the deportation to Babylon, 14 generations. And from the deportation to Babylon to the Christ, 14 generations. Contained in that, masterfully, the 11th verse discusses the king that, or the one individual that is uh, wanted to be forgotten, but actually puts a point against the premillennial discussion to keep Jesus from being a king on the earth. The descendants of Kaniah, as Jehovah has removed the J-E from the beginning of his name, the descendants of Jeconiah or Kaniah will never be allowed to reign or rule on the earth Therefore, Jesus' throne never could have been one of a physical kingdom on the earth. It had been cursed by God uh, through the prophet Jeremiah. David couldn't build the temple because he was a man of blood. He was, the Bible specifically uses the words that he was a man of war who, who had shed much blood. Jesus was is considered the prince of peace for in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell and through him to reconcile all to himself all things whether on earth or in heaven making peace by the blood of his cross and the peace uh, there's the peace that has come back around that's highlighted from the descendant Solomon earlier and so it would almost look like there is some backwards that uh, you have David shedding blood, expanding the kingdom, and he has a son of peace. And then when it comes back around that, they, that uh, Christ is the prince of peace, who by the shedding of blood makes his own kingdom, which is the next point, that the blood that he is known for is his own. Because he is the prince of peace and, and has shed his own blood, he can set up the temple, and the temple is you. Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him, for God's temple is holy, and you are that temple. Now, this could have been a great place to, to take the, the lesson and to divert it somewhere like uh, the maintenance of the temple or all the holy artifacts that were associated with the temple or the, the activities of the festivals that were done with the temple uh, and, and how that worked in David's time and how that would correlate to us but it's not where we're going specifically the temple is where the people met God or the temple is where God met the people this is only done through an inter intermediary I'm terrible with that word it was only done through one guy who could go in between them and that guy was the priest here Jesus is the priest. He's also God inside you, stepping on the sermon from two weeks. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, always carrying in the body, that would be the temple. You're the temple of God, your body, the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may be manifest in your temple, your body. For we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifest in our mortal flesh. So death is at work within us, but life in you. And so my first thought in trying to put all this together was, how do I reconcile that the life of Jesus may be manifest in our mortal flesh and, and the destroying of the temple over and over? Except it's not the temple that we're worried about. It's where you meet God that we're worried about. And that in your body, 
you are showing other people where to meet God, which is a prayer that we would often pray uh, that David Moody really kind of coined in my ears and started, let other people see that we are Christians and ask us why. Let other people see where to meet God and ask about that, which goes directly to us being able to show people who God is and that he's more than a king that was supposed to reign on this earth, that Jesus is our redeemer and the hope that dwells in us, in our body. The David was unable to build the temple because he was a man of blood. Because of Jesus' blood and the blood that he shed, being his own and laying down his own life, he was able to make us a temple to bring God to us, to be a redeemer to us, yet that does not keep him from still having a war of his own against those who are his enemy. In Revelation chapter 19, a passage that I like to read, it really shows that Jesus is going to keep those who are his, and he's going to war against those who are not. And at the very end of that, where it describes his robe as being bloodstained with his enemies. It says, on his robe and on his thigh, he has the name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. <clears throat> what are kings for? When, when you think of a king, and we really don't do this anymore, uh, nearly as much as, as in the Middle Ages, but the king was the one who ruled over the territory, who everyone in the territory was subject to when you were in the territory. And they may protect you as a matter of protecting themselves, but that's pretty much where that stopped. Like, sure, if there's a siege against you, let's everybody come inside the castle, make sure you bring your crops with you. And I'll protect you as far as I can. But Jesus goes further than that and his authority as king and says not only will I protect you I will exalt you I will save you I will give you salvation see to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit according to human tradition according to the elemental spirits of the world and not according to Christ for in him the fullness the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily and you have been filled in him who is head over all rule and authority. In him you also were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Having been buried with him in baptism which, not, which you were, in which you were also raised with him through faith, in the powerful working of God who has raised him from the dead and you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh God made alive together with him having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands this he set aside nailing it to the cross disarming the rulers and authorities and putting them to open shame by triumphing over them in him Verse 9, in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. He's so much more than a king that I can't even fully, un I don't know that I fully understand all of the implications that verse 9 has with its direction backward in, in scripture and forward, what it means for me. But that he is all and that all is in him that you have been filled with him who is the head of all rule and authority. He's so much more than a king. And with what he is as a God, he desires for me to share that with him. I'm kind of glad that he's not a physical king. The guy that I read earlier, Staub, he's a Jewish rabbi, 
PhD, nice little accolades to his names or to his name. How less worthy if just this earth was fixed? How less terrific and wonderful if it was still all about this earth? Even if this earth was great, even if we all lived in a castle and you drove a golden car and the temperature was always perfect for you at whatever that is, think speaking in tongues because for me it's going to be cold and you get to be warm or whatever. As great as this earth could be, it pales in comparison to the heaven that we get to go to. Why would we want that? Why would you take the lesser reward? Why would we accept the lesser Christ that is being looked for for so many people? Jesus is so much more than a king like David. He is a redeemer. He is an example. He is a God. And he wants us to be with him. He's made that available to us. So many of us have accepted that.